So our next speaker is Vesna Manojlovic, who is going to tell us the story of using RIPE Atlas API for measuring IPv6 reachability. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vesna. I'm really happy to be speaking at FOSDEM. And I'm uh, honored to be invited here. And I'm grateful that uh, I got uh, a time slot of 50 minutes, because I like to talk a lot. And 15, mi 50 minutes is not even going to be enough. So don't ask any questions uh, during the talk. <laughs> Just wait until uh, I cover all of these six topics that I actually want to cover. And then uh, we can uh, do the questions uh, and answers later. So uh, how many of you know, uh, have heard about RIPE? Wow, almost everybody. OK, great. So that's going to be a really short introduction that I'm going to uh, do there. Then I've heard already that there were questions to the previous speaker about how can you get IPv6. I'm going to talk about that. Then I will cover the RIPE Atlas. So what is it? And how can you use the RIPE Atlas measurements? And then I'm going to combine that with IPv6 topic and, and see, uh, say how can you actually do IPv6 measurements using RIPE Atlas. And in the end, I will tell you how you can take part in the RIPE Atlas community. This is my favorite topic because uh, I'm community builder and all these other technical details are uh, less important than the actual community around these tools. So the, the main thing that you have to remember about RIPE is that it is completely different from RIPE NCC. So mostly people say RIPE when they mean RIPE NCC, but they're two different things. So RIPE is you, and RIPE NCC is me. And uh, RIPE is a community of network operators uh, that was formed in uh, 89. It was a bunch of people who thought, ah, this OSI stack is not going anywhere. We actually want to build IP networks, and uh, we need to stay in touch with each other and connect our networks uh, to, to each other and have this database with who is details so that we can get in touch. And so they uh, started having regular meetings and agreeing on the things, writing right documents and so on. And then in 92, they created a company called RIPE NCC, RIPE Network Coordination Center, that was actually coordinating the work of these operators. So that's how it started, and uh, uh, RIPE NCC is now a company situated in Amsterdam that has about 120 employees. I work for RIPE NCC, and there's about five of my colleagues here in the audience today. And uh, the, the policies that we implement are decided by the RIPE community. So you are the guys who tell us what to do, and then we only do it. Uh, and so uh, the RIPE NCC is funded by the members, by the uh, companies that need mostly IP addresses or are interested in our other products and services. So the similar things exist uh, in uh, the rest of the world. So on this map, you can see how we have divided the world between five regional internet registries. And they are very similar to each other. They're similar to the RIPE NCC. However, they have all regional small differences and the, the, the distribution of IP addresses and all these policies are de decentralized in such a way that they are different in five different continental regions. RIPE NCC has a main function, or it had the main function in 92 to distribute IP resources. But we also do all kinds of other things. So as I said, we give out IP addresses, AS numbers. We keep the WHOIS database up and running. But uh, we also develop tools uh, that are available not only to our members, but to all the communities. We work on the security, and we work on the training. And on the other hand, we also operate other services that are of the benefit for the whole internet community, for example, K root name server is maintained by us. And um, we, get, uh, uh, we take a part in internet governance on behalf of the right community. And uh, we also develop measurement tools that I'm going to talk about, for, like RIPE Atlas. So the, uh, the students are not coming very often to our meetings, and we want to attract them, and we are now developing this cooperation with educational organizations and inviting students to come to the right meetings that happen two times a year. 
Next one is in Warsaw in May. And so if you are a student, a PhD student, or if you know somebody who is doing research in networking, please apply. And we have the uh, sponsored invitation for five students who will have their expenses paid to go and talk to the operators within the RIPE community and explain their work and meet the people who are interested in, in their work promoted that way. So please uh, take a look at this and uh, tell your friends that uh, they should come to the RIPE meeting. How many of you were ever at the RIPE meeting? Okay. Quite a few. Well, it's a, it's a five-day conference, and there's about 500 people attending, mostly from ISP and telco businesses, and uh, it's an interesting event, and it's not very expensive, so you should give it a try, even if you're not a student. So, how to get V6? So, who of you has V6 at home, or at work, or in the hackerspace? Okay, most of you. So. This, uh, this part you probably know. So where do the IPv6 addresses come from? Well, basically they come from IETF. This is not on the graph, so on the top of this whole structure there is IETF, and they gave uh, one-eighth of the whole IPv6 space to IANA, so that's slash three. So IANA is then distributing allocations, huge big blocks of that space to regional registries, and regional registries like RIPE NCC allocates big blocks to ISPs and then they give smaller blocks to smaller ISPs or to the end users. So it's a hierarchical distribution and uh, it makes sure that the aggregation of address space works and that the routing works. There is a lot of terminology allocations, assignment, provider independent, and there can be all kinds of statuses that describe these objects in the RIPE database. My colleagues give the training courses in IPv6, so a part of this is from their training course material, and these courses are available to the members of the RIPE NCC, but the material is available to anybody, so you can just download this and, uh, and learn all the details there. I will not dwell on the details here. So if you are an ISP, if you're a member of the RIPE NCC, you can get an allocation of the slash 32 size if you have a plan to start using it within the next two years. So criteria for getting IP6 allocation is not really very hard. So you just have to say, sure, I have a plan, and then you will get this big chunk of uh, IP addresses. If you don't need such a large IP space, and if you don't want to be an LIR, you can get provider independent addresses through another LIR, through another organization, and that costs 50 euros a year. So this is another way of getting uh, IPv6 space, but only for yourself. So you cannot make assignments to the third party. So this is just for your organization, the PI assignment. If you are not an ISP, you can still get IPv6 addresses. The previous speaker mentioned tunneling, but there is also the private IPv6 space if you just want to, uh, to test it. So there are some uh, links here on this slide. And if you, are, uh, if you have a small business, or if you just want IPv6 for yourself, for your home, do ask your ISP. And don't believe them when they say, oh, you are the first one to ask. You are not the first one to ask. And uh, even if you are, just keep on insisting on it. And uh, ask them to give you a large block. So up to slash 48 uh, is actually allowed according to the policies. So I have with me here um, a lot of goodies. And some of them are these IPv6 uh, charts that you can get from us, which explain like what is slash 48, how many subnets can you make from that, and so on. Again, this is not uh, the, major, the main topic of this talk, so I won't go there. So this is the, one of the best handouts that we ever made. So the IPv6 subnetting chart and the CIDR chart also that, uh, that explains the subnetting of v6 and v4. So you can pick them, uh, pick them up later here. 
So just for the security aware in the audience, there are some security considerations that you have to be aware of uh, in IPv6 world. And we also do kind of measurement of the IPv6 readiness within the members of the RIPE NCC. So we call it IPv6 ripeness, and uh, it shows per country how many of our members have asked for the IPv6 space, did they register the route object in the WHOIS database, did they uh, enable reverse DNS, and did they announce their space. So if they do all those four things, then they have four-star IPv6 ripeness, and they get a T-shirt. Now, this has been the biggest enabler of IPv6 deployment in Europe, the fact that you get free T-shirt if you <laughs> achieve these four stars. And it doesn't mean that you actually have any traffic, customers, nothing. It just means you are ready, and you can do ping, and you get a free T-shirt. So um, people have been actually like struggling for this, like, yes, and I have it. And, and so um, some other people, they were saying, yeah, come on, this doesn't really measure anything. So can you go, can you, can you show us uh, a bit more, like who is actually ready? So we developed something called Fifth Star IP6 ripeness. And if you look at this graph, on this URL, you can get it like for every country. On average, it's about 50%. So half of our members kind of go to that readiness state that they can actually do IPv6 if they want to, if they have a business model and for doing it and so on. But when we measured how many of them are actually doing it, it's about 10%. And uh, we didn't even bother making a t-shirt for that category. So we are still working on that. And uh, uh, yeah, this is one of the ways to, to encourage people to move to IPv6. How many of you actually have that t-shirt? Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, great. It's a, it's a blue one. It says IPv6 Act Now. So, uh, yeah. Black. Yours is black. That's a newer model. Okay. <laughs> so, we have other t-shirts for iPatlas. I have two here. They're for girls. So, uh, Meet me later uh, to, to get a t-shirt from Ripe Atlas. And uh, yeah, this is, this is another map of the world which, uh, which shows where we are. We are all over the world, mostly in Europe, of course. And in the actual numbers, there is a bit more than 4,700 active Ripe Atlas probes around the world and about half of them do IPv6. So we have almost 10,000 users, and RIPE Atlas users can do pings, trace routes, DNS, and SSL measurements from things like this. So who can take part in RIPE Atlas? Anybody. So you just ask for one of these probes, and we ship it to you for free. If you're here, you can see me later. I have another 10 or 15 here, and you can get them from me. And you plug it in, and so the, uh, what happens then is that your probe starts doing measurements towards root name servers. This is what RIPE NCC cares about. Uh, the root name servers are critical internet infrastructure, and we measure them from about 5,000 locations around the world. And we do the pings and trace routes and DNS lookups for them. We collect all the data and publish it to everybody to use. If you are hosting one of these probes, then you can register it and uh, either through the web interface or the API, which I will talk about later, you can do your own pings and trace routes to any other destination that you want from other people's probes. So the fact that you have plugged in the probe enables other people to use your probe, for example, from France, uh, to do measurements towards Brazil or wherever. So it's a truly community-driven project. It's based on the uh, contributions of volunteers who are ready to plug this uh, probe into their network and to contribute a little bit of bandwidth and electricity so that we can collect a lot of data. 
So this is uh, the version three of the probe. We used to have the small little black sexy ones uh, like over there on the picture. And uh, they were uh, a bit too expensive for us. So now we are using the off the shelf hardware that we overwrite. So this used to be a TP-Link wireless router, but it doesn't do that anymore. So it does exactly the same as the old probe, which is pings, trace routes, DNS, and SSL queries. It's running Linux, and um, that's about it from the technical side that I'm going to say here. If you want to know more, there are engineers here who are working on it, and they can get into all these details with you later. And uh, the other box, the large one here, it's a Sucris box that is now uh, used as a RIPE Atlas anchor. So these anchors are larger blo uh, boxes that can do more measurements, and they also use deliberately as targets for the measurements. So our plan is to have uh, about 100 by the end of this year. We have 36 currently, and they will give us the regional baseline and what is maybe unfortunately called future history, but um, the longer explanation is that if we start doing these regional measurements now, then in the future we'll be able to look back and see how did connectivity in a certain region develop historically. This is uh, actually a very good case for the countries which don't have internet exchange yet. So if you start measuring how the traffic in those countries is going all over the place and to the other countries and so on, and how when you put the internet exchange there, the, the traffic stays local. But with uh, RIPE Atlas anchors and probes, we'll be able to visualize this and show it later on. So if you want one of these, you can apply, and we are still accepting applications, especially from the developing countries, let's say. So we have enough of them deployed in Europe, but we would like to, have to see more in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, where we don't have such good contacts. So if you have some contacts there, please let me know later on. These were the hosts of RIPE Atlas Anchors in 2013. This year we have another 15 or 16. Uh, we are still working on collecting their logos, but we want to promote their organizations because they help us with the project. The, the difference between the small boxes and the larger one is that these we give out for free and these your organization has to buy. It's around 800 euros or less if you can get a better deal with Sucris. So um, one of the major challenges after we collect all this data is how to visualize it. So recently we have developed in cooperation with the uh, visualization experts from uh, Italy the, the seismograph and the zoomable ping graph. So the seismograph looks like this. So it takes the 20 pings. So if you say, I want to ping from 20 probes in Italy towards the target in Germany, and it takes all those results and puts it on one graph. And then there is a lot of things that you can tweak on the, on the controls here. So should it show you the maximums of, or averages? Um, and uh, then you can decide, actually, I don't want to see this one uh, of them, so you switch it off. I want to see only these from the specific AS number. So there is a lot of uh, power in this uh, visualization that we call seismograph. And the other one is a ping graph, which uh, is replacing multiple RRD graphs that we used to have. So for like a daily and weekly and monthly view, we had them all separate. And now you, go, you can see it all in one graph, and then you zoom in, uh, depending on the level of detail that, uh, that you're interested in. So what are the people actually using this uh, RIPE Atlas for? Well, uh, there are several use cases and success stories that we had in the past. So for example, when the L root operators have installed one of their Anycast instances in, in Belgrade, in the Serbian Open Exchange, then the, the ping graph for uh, one of the probes in Belgrade went down. So you can see it here on the graph. So it went from 50 milliseconds to three. 
And then those people in the internet exchange could go to their boss and say, you see, this is actually why we wanted to install the L root in this location, because now we get uh, less latency. So then other people can go to their boss and say, this is what is going to happen. This is kind of a, a success story. Then some uh, people who um, maintain the Anika service for .fr, they wanted to see from a different vantage points around the world how many uh, users are querying which specific instance of their Anycast. And then they could schedule those measurements on the RIP Atlas probes and then just see percentages and then uh, troubleshoot and say, wait a minute, why is this one the most popular? And maybe even put some more capacity there. And why is this one the least popular? Is, are there any problems with that one? So uh, they could use uh, RIP Atlas for, for this kind of uh, research. And then finally, if there is some kind of uh, outage event on the internet, we can see the impact using data from RIPE Atlas. So again, uh, just a, a short uh, story about the security aspects here. Um, the, uh, yeah, people ask us, well, why would I plug in a, a black box into my network? What does it do? So we have to keep on explaining how does it work actually. And uh, so the, the probe itself has keys on it. They initiate connection with, uh, with our backend servers and then our backend server uh, schedules the measurement to them. So once you have this probe, you do not actually um, have access, you don't have direct access to your own probe you only log in to the web interface of the RIPE NCC, you say, I would like to schedule pings from those other 100 probes, and then we send those commands to those 100 probes. So you don't have access to other people's probes, they don't have access to your probe either. And um, there are no passive measurements running on them. Uh, the code is uh, available, it's on GitHub of the measurements that are, measurement types that are running on it. And uh, we were, until now, we were actually very lucky to have the community that uh, uh, was using responsible disclosure to tell us when they found some vulnerabilities on the probes. So we dealt with that, we published it, so we are quite transparent about it. You can see reports on, on our security page. So with this kind of um, outreach, to other communities and, and our users, we are hoping that uh, if you find something that is wrong with the probe or that could be done better, that you will approach us first and not go and publish a paper somewhere and say, I hacked the Ripe Atlas probe. And we can promise you a t-shirt if you first come to us. <laughs> so my uh, other pet project was to go to a lot of hackerspaces and uh, put the RIPE Atlas probe there. And then, uh, since that is yet another community project, then uh, people from hackerspaces.org went and made uh, their own API and uh, made a map of which hackerspace actually does have a RIPE Atlas probe. So um, you have to, if, if your hackerspace is taking part there, you can uh, go to your own page or, uh, on this wiki and say uh, from the hardware, have RIPE Atlas probe, and then it's going to appear on this map. So that's quite nice too. And uh, we have some plans for the future. Our roadmap is public, and we actually adjust it based on the requests from the community. So uh, please let me know if you would like something else in the future for the RIPE Atlas. So finally, how does it all work? Well, the measurements uh, possible to do through API and through the web interface. So the API itself, well, it's just a lot of programming, so I cannot put it on the slides. I'm not a programmer, and so I'm just going to talk about like how do you do it through the web interface, but all of that, all those steps are actually possible to do through the API, and it's all very well documented, and uh, you can find it on these links. So how does it work? Well, you have to log in. Um, you click on my measurements, you choose some um, parameters, and that's it. Then it just starts. And then there is uh, another link where you download data. 
So what can you do with that data? Oh, first, I'm going to talk about credits. So uh, in order not to overload the system, we have developed something called credit system. So once you run a probe, you earn credits. And then you spend them to schedule the measurements. It's that simple. And uh, there is like a price list somewhere on the website in the documentation section. So it says ping costs this much and the trace route costs this much. And then when you schedule the measurement, it says it's going to cost you this and this many credits. And then there are nice graphs that show how does it decrease, increase, and whatever. Um, the, the thing is with the API, you have to provide a key to prove which user you are so that we know how much to bill you. So this is why I'm even mentioning it here because that's a little bit more complicated. Like when you log in, we know who you are. But if you're using API, you have to first generate a key, then put that key in your API call so that we would know who has scheduled this measurement. If you uh, want to spend a lot of credits and uh, it's not enough how much you earn from uh, hosting one probe, you can host multiple probes or you can host the Ripe Atlas Anchor, then you get 10 times as many credits. If you are a member of the Ripe NCC, we have the interface which says, give me 1 million credits. You just click there and then we give you 1 million credits um, several times. So you can get like as many credits as you want. And if you are a researcher, then you just should talk to us and then we will give you enough credits to do your uh, research project because uh, these credits were actually designed just to protect the system from overload and we are not there yet. So, and to uh, ensure some kind of fairness. So currently there is enough capacity and uh, the credit system should not stop you from doing the interesting measurements and the interesting work that you, that you want. So please talk to us. Uh, the newest thing that we have developed is uh, the input to your existing monitoring systems. So it's not monitoring per se, it's enabling monitoring. And so how does it work? Well, you schedule a measurement, you say, I want this website of mine to be um, pinged from 1,000 probes around the world every few minutes. And then you um, also decide the tre on a threshold, like out of those 1,000 probes, if 500 fail, I want to be notified. And so the notification itself is another API call. So you go to this URL with your measurement ID, and then this API will tell you true or false based on the threshold that you have decided. And then you can put that into Nagios or Itzinga or existing monitoring system so that, um, yeah, you don't have to like rely on our tools. You already have your own tools, but the Atlas can give you input for your own tools. And so the documentation is online. This is not really public yet. So give it a try. It's totally not production uh, service. So don't rely only on this, but it is a good add-on to your existing monitoring systems. And the guy who wrote it is sitting over there, so <laughs> uh, you can approach him later on. Does this sound cool? Is this what you always wanted? Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, we have uh, quite, a people, quite a few people who are very enthusiastic about the possibilities of Atlas. So they made their own hands-on tutorials and uh, they know what they're talking about, uh, like me, because I'm like trying to promote this with the community, but they actually did all these measurements and they made the, the material and the workshop and everything and it's totally available. So uh, take a look, like there's step-by-step -step instructions on how do you do this API call or that or whatever. So um, yeah, check it out there. We are very grateful, and uh, if you do something like this, please let us know, because next time I'm going to put that on the slide. Finally, getting back to IPv6. So all of this that I talked about until now, of course, can do IPv6. But some people did a lot of V6 research already, so I'm just going to kind of lead you through these examples to give you inspiration on what can you do. 
So uh, somebody said, well, how is the IPv6 routing happening uh, currently? Is there filtering based on the prefix size going on? In other words, if I get only slash 48, can this be visible in the routing table, IPv6 routing table around the world? How many people are not going to see my slash 48 prefix? And the answer is about 1%. So if you do the multi-homing with announcing more specific prefix of the existing uh, larger block then 1% of the current IPv6 routing world is not going to be able to reach your prefix and based on the results from the RIPE Atlas. So uh, this, is, this has been done a few years ago actually, so by now maybe results are a little bit different. So this was about BGP routing um, and the filtering there. In the DNS, some people are also doing filtering of quote day records and that causes unexpected problems to other operators and we also looked into that. So uh, a lot of these use cases are described in the RIPE Labs articles and so all the technical details are there. The 50 minutes time slot is not enough for me to tell you everything about it. So uh, the V6 launch day uh, was a very good opportunity for a lot of people to test their V6 capability and reachability of their services. So they actually used RIPE Atlas to see how visible they are from the rest of the world. And uh, some real operators gave us their feedback on what, can they, what could they uh, achieve with uh, looking into the RIPE Atlas results. So, uh, yeah, they, they could uh, actually direct the traffic to other POPs based on the results that they were getting from RIPE Atlas, that some POPs were less reachable than the others, some upstreams were less, less reliable than others. So they actually achieved traffic optimizations based on the results from RIPE Atlas. So that's the first uh, example. And the second one is um, looking into what would happen if we switch off V4 how much of the V6 only internet would be visible? And the answer is two thirds. So that's like very simplified. And the actual details are in the article. So uh, that means that like 40% of the, of the dual stacked websites would not be visible if the eyeballs would have IP, only IPv6, so if the eyeballs would not be on a dual stack network. And uh, again, we tried some uh, beautiful visualizations of this data, also for the V6 launch day, uh, although this was available only to the members of the RIPE NCC. So they could go to the even simpler web interface in their LIR portal and just type in the, the host name or the IP address of the host service that they wanted to test. And then from a thousand uh, IPv6 enabled websites around the world, uh, probes around the world, we would generate trace routes and then visualize them. So they would get two graphs, one with all the trace routes that succeeded and the other one with all the trace routes that did not get to the destination and then they, you would be able to click through all the hops and see which AS numbers all these trace routes went through and who do you have to contact so they would fix their V6 connectivity. Uh, Path MTU, that was also quite an uh, often a research project both for our own uh, scientists within the RIPE NCC and the students that were busy with this. So um, again, uh, they found out that fragmentation indeed is a problem in the IPv6 world and uh, what can you do uh, to, to actually fix this problem. So RIPE Atlas is also used for the IPv6 troubleshooting. So this is uh, from two weeks ago. Uh, somebody said, why is this measurement not working? And then we were like, oh, um, it's a bug. Uh, it should not work at all, but uh, it actually, uh, so some probes were sitting behind some broken resolvers and they were 
um, like claiming to have IPv6 while it was actually not working. And then uh, only from, I don't know, from 10 probes, uh, nine, nine said, well, that target uh, does not even have IPv6, so I cannot do IPv6 measurement. And one said, sure, I'll try. And then it failed. And then this guy was saying, why did it fail? And so we managed to kind of troubleshoot. And he was like, oh, I thought uh, this website of mine had V6, and now I see that it doesn't have. So that he fixed it. So this is one of the real life examples. And uh, the other researcher already uh, mentioned, Stefan Bortzmeier, he um, uh, said, well, a lot of devices around the internet think they have V6, but they don't. Uh, how about Ripe Atlas probes? Indeed, the same. Some of the Ripe Atlas probes also think that they have IPv6, but they don't. So uh, when you try to schedule the measurement from a thousand probes that claim they have IPv6, you will never get 100% success rate because 10% of them actually cannot do IPv6 at all. So this is something that you have to take into consideration when you are uh, examining results that it's not always your fault. It is also the fact that a lot of uh, eyeballs do not have working IPv6, even if they are Ripatos probes. So this slide I'm not going to go through, but uh, if you actually are interested in writing applications for IPv6, uh, there is a lot of help over there. A lot of these URLs have a lot of helpful information. And the one that, uh, that is my favorite is about spelling. So how do you write IPv6 addresses uh, in uppercase, lowercase, all the possible versions of shortening, the number of zeros, and so on? There are some recommendations about it and uh, very nice examples of how do you read the log files, uh, stuff like that, when there are letters involved and colons. So to finish my talk, I will just give you a few possible ways on uh, how can you take part in the RIPE community. So for the software writing people, there is a repository on GitHub where we collect the scripts and programs of uh, people who use Drive Atlas to analyze the data. So if you make something useful, please share it with the rest of the community. And he, this is just the graphs on how many people actually took part at which time. I didn't want to put more URLs, this is prettier. But the title is clickable and uh, yeah, the name is also self-explanatory. It's called Ripe Atlas Community. There you can also find the link to the source code if you would like to examine how does it work. And uh, we have published some of our own tools for analyzing data in the same community repository. If you are very enthusiastic about uh, spreading the love uh, for Ripe Atlas, you can get multiple probes and give them to your friends. We are then going to call you Ripe Atlas ambassador and uh, we'll like you a lot. You Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a special mailing list. So, um, yeah, you might get a t-shirt. We, st we are still not sure who are we giving these t-shirts to, so uh, please see me later to get a t-shirt. It's really pretty. Look, it has a, has a globe. Um, if you have money to give to us, we will take it. Thank you. <laughs> In that case, we will call you a sponsor and we'll put your logo on the next slide, on the next FOSDEM to, to show how grateful we are. And this enables us to make t-shirts, to actually give this hardware for free and to ship it around the world and not just to RIPE NCC members. And uh, then you can get more probes for your, for your own company and uh, well, you can get that anyway if you are an ambassador. But, if you have money and you want to support us that way, thank you. And uh, so we always are, like to ask you some questions. So for example, what, should, what shall we do with HTTP measurements? They're technically possible on the probe. Our researchers also do them because uh, they are careful and we trust them. But it's not open to the community yet through 
um, the reason is, uh, well, political sensitivity and so on. So we would like to get some guide, guidance from the community. How should we deal with the HTTP measurements? Um, the system checks for monitoring. How much work should we put more into this? Or uh, how complicated should we make it? How easy should we make it for you? Um, IPv6, what else shall we do? Uh, should the data be more open or should it be possible to do private measurements? All these questions are still open and we are working together with you to, to figure out what are we go, where is the RIPE Atlas going to go in the future. If you have success stories, let us know. We will put them on the next slides. And you can get in touch in many, many ways with us. Atlas.ripe.net has all the information. We are on Twitter. We have mailing lists. We are going to all the conferences. And uh, I'm very happy to be here and to take some questions. Questions, anybody? Yeah. Uh, can you say you trust the data? Is there any chance that there are uh, rogue nodes that just see the protocol and send similar data out that is completely wrong? We do the checks. When we receive the data, we actually do the checks to see if, uh, if the data is rubbish or not. So if somebody is very, very, very sophisticated and like manages to send us like the data that is almost the same as what we would expect, but it's actually rubbish, then mm, it might happen. But until now, that was not a problem. And uh, we have other security measures to enable only our probes to connect to our infrastructure. But I'm not saying this as a challenge. I'm just saying that this is how we uh, uh, check the data that arrives to, to our backend. Uh, we have a SIP network and we are using, we have Anycast, which pops in many different countries. Uh, could we use the Atlas network to then see which carriers end up going to which uh, uh, actual uh, machine yes. in that case? Yes, you can, uh, because we, do, we use Atlas exactly for the same purpose, to test how the Anycast of the K-root uh, server works and so we have developed because of that we have developed maps that show exactly which instance of which Anika server has answered to which probe and in different colors and so on so uh, yeah okay let's thank our speaker oh sorry <coughs> So, um, you know, if a probe is connected via uh, IPv4 or IPv6, did you think about distinguish between native and tunneled IPv6 connectivity? Yes, we did think about it, but currently you cannot uh, select the probes based on native or tunneled v6 when you're doing the measurement. So after you receive the data, you can analyze it, and there you can see what kind of connectivity uh, the probe had, but you cannot do it in advance yeah. as, as of yet. But it is on the roadmap. People have been asking for, for this already, and well, we will work on it at some point. Okay. I, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.